go ahead and call this meeting of the Board of uh, Trustees for the Tyler Independent School District to order. Uh, we do have a presence of a quorum and the meeting has been duly called and the notice of the meeting has been posted in the time and manner required. Do we have anybody for public participation? No, sir. No public participants. Okay. Well, then we'll jump right in. Uh, we have the Tyler ISD Foundation annual report. It's Betsy Jones. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Betsy Jones, and I'm the executive director of the foundation. I look forward to meeting you all soon. Um, first off, I would just say we've had another great year with the foundation, and we're so thankful for y'all's support um, and strong partnership with us. It's been a great year, um, a unique ending, but a great year. And so I just have some general information I'm gonna share about our programs, activities, and financials, and we'll entertain questions at any time. So if you all will look at the next slide um, that's titled Tyler ISD Foundation. Oh, oh, I get to click it, okay. There, okay. Um, so I know that most of you all are very familiar with the work of the foundation, but we are an independent nonprofit corporation uh, that is focused on supporting quality education in the district. And our mission is to provide resources to inspire learning, to enrich teaching, and to enhance opportunities for district students. Uh, but you can really kind of boil the work of the foundation down to we seek funds in order to grant those funds in meaningful and impactful ways. Um, and so you can see here the yellow boxes are the ways that we typically seek funds. We host an annual campaign each year that targets individual donors and corporate sponsors. We have an employee giving campaign each year that allows TISD employees to participate through a payroll deduction or one-time gift. We write grants. We have several endowment funds that produce distributions. And then we also typically have a special campaign or event. And this year it was the BRIC campaign. And then the way that we typically try to positively impact the district are through the green boxes over there. So support for TISD events and programs, things like convocation, teacher retirement, teacher of the year. We manage several scholarships for graduating seniors. Um, we host an event called Night of Shining Stars, which I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit more about later, but that honors our top graduates and distinguished educators. Um, and then we also offer professional development and emergency grants. And then the heart of our work is really the Grants for Great Ideas, which allow funding for classroom and campus grants for our teachers. Okay, so moving on then to our actual um, results for this year. Now, just to start with, our these are all as of May 31st. Our fiscal year ends when y'all's does, at the end of August. So we still will have some movement, but this is where we are now. Um, and just to start, just to kind of share with you guys, as far as COVID-19 impacts go, we were very fortunate because the vast majority of our fundraising occurs in the fall. And so we had concluded the vast majority of our campaigns. Um, the spring is when we typically expend most of our funds and we were still able to do that. The primary impact for us was the fact that we were not able to gather together for Night of Shining Stars, but instead we're able to honor and recognize those students and educators in many of the same ways that we did, just not actually physically together. So that's kind of from a COVID-19 impact. But from a revenue perspective, um, currently we have just under $300,000 in revenue. Um, that is an increase of over 25% over last year, which we're very thankful for. Uh, the primary sources for that increase are uh, an increase in TISD employee giving, we are up about 30% in the total amount pledged this year. And what's interesting is that fewer employees participated this year, about 50 fewer, but those that did participate, participated at a higher level, which was wonderful. So uh, in the past, we've had a lot of employees participate with a $1 one-time gift, which is great and we love, but it's also been nice to have some employees really support the foundation at an even higher level. Um, we also had some increased grant awards. We were awarded a Women's Fund of Smith County grant for over $60,000 for the Caldwell Ceramics Lab. Um, and we were given a $10,000 grant from the Heard Foundation to support COVID-19 family and student need efforts. So that was good as well. 
And then the last uh, primary increase was our BRIC campaign has been quite successful. We've hosted three rounds over the past 18 months. Um, and this year that produced over $33,000. And then last fiscal year, just under $30,000. Um, we were able to increase the number of our corporate sponsors and individual donors, which is always one of our goals. We want to have as wide a support net as possible within the community. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say about revenue is just that we are on a two-year funding cycle. So all of the unrestricted funding that we raise in this fiscal year serves as our operational budget for next year, which provides great stability for us. It allows for us to plan uh, just how much we have available for grants and things like that, so we're not trying to raise and spend funds within the same fiscal year. Okay, the next slide here, gifts to Tyler ISD, that's primarily how we spend our money is in gifts uh, to TISD, and so, so far this year we've given over $172,000 to the district. Um, that's the highest amount in over 10 years, so we're so thankful to be able to do that. Uh, just delving in a little bit deeper into some of those programs, uh, grants for Great Ideas, we had the highest number of applications we've ever received, so 68 grant applications this year, which we were so excited about. Um, and then we were able to actually fund the highest number and amount that we've ever done as well. So we funded 38 grants for over $80,000. Um, we also, the foundation has two endowment funds that benefit TISD Fine Arts specifically. And so this year we partnered with Tyler ISD Visual and Performing Arts to include uh, fine arts grants in our process, and which was great because it really allowed for equitable uh, distribution of those funds across campuses. So that has been really nice. From a scholarship perspective, we this is the first year we've ever sponsored a Team One Tyler scholarship. So we got to sponsor a faculty member from John Tyler, which was wonderful. Uh, we awarded nine student scholarships, and this year we awarded our first ever apprenticeship scholarship. So Styles Electric offered an electrician apprenticeship. Uh, one of the students is, is a, a part of that program, and so we did a scholarship for him to purchase some tools and equipment that he needed for that apprenticeship program. Um, we also started the Tyler ISD shout out program, which allowed for recognition of teachers and staff during our distance learning, and we provided them with a gift card from a local business or restaurant to try to help everybody out there. Um, and then we were still able to do our Night of Shining Stars recognition, which I brought you all uh, the program from it because it is a great thing to look through if you're having a tough day in education because it, these are amazing students and amazing educators, and to be able to read about the impact that they each have on one another is really inspirational. Okay, the last page here is just a financial snapshot for the past five years so you all can kind of see where we are and where we've been. Uh, we're in a very strong position. Our investments have taken some recent hits, but that is okay because those are long-term holdings and we will still be able to take the distributions that we have planned for the coming fiscal year, even in their current state. Um, and the other thing that I'll say is that our bylaws require us to have certain percentages in activities that benefit Tyler ISD versus long-term planning versus our payroll and operations. And we are well within those ranges and so the health of the foundation is, is strong and um, uh, things are looking really good. So our board will meet next week to do our final planning for the upcoming school year um, to set our giving priorities and uh, fundraising goals and all that kind of good stuff. So everything is good with the foundation. May I answer any questions from you guys? Just a, a refresher, um, when was the Tyler ISD Foundation founded? How 1990. Long it, that was 1990, mm -hmm. okay. Yes, we were really one of the very first educational foundations in Texas. It was kind of, the, and it's, it's gone through different iterations. It mm -hmm. was a part of the district at its beginning and then it broke away into its own independent corporation uh, shortly after. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. 
different iterations. I love that. That's we'll just that say that, kind. right? Yeah. Peaks and valleys <laughs> along the way. <laughs> but um, I'm going to pass out uh, the Night of Shining Stars programs, and I also brought a couple grants for Great Ideas brochures for you all, just so you could see. I don't think you were on my mailing list at that time, so I'll give you those as well. But as always, we're here for you know questions, and we're here to support and benefit you guys, so please just let me know how we can help. D don't leave yet. Oh. Um, I have just one thing to say and then a question for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a great example of the importance of leadership, and you have done a phenomenal job over the last couple of years um, pulling the foundation out of a financial ditch and uh, a leadership ditch. And so I've served on the foundation board as the ex officio rep for the school board for the last couple of years. It's been fun to watch you um, take charge and uh, really improve the level of performance and then the contribution to TISD. It's been good. Well, thank um, you. The board also um, is a good board in that it holds you accountable and there's a clear scorecard. And so there's one, one part of every meeting <laughs> is we review the scorecard for Betsy <laughs> on how Betsy is doing. And one of her metrics is the percentage of trustees that contribute to the foundation. That is and true. so I was just, I don't know, I know you've been working on this, I don't mm -hmm. know where we are today, but could you um, let this board know how you're doing on your metric to make sure we all contribute to the foundation? Yes, so we are currently at 58% of trustee school board giving. Um, I, now, there's been obviously some changes in the school board this year, but Yes, we would welcome your contribution and support in any amount so that we could report 100% support by our district's leadership. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, Fritt. <laughs> there have been personal notes and emails and things. I try to be a soft asker. Yes, we would love your support. So let me give you. Well, we appreciate the partnership, and you guys do so much for the district. It's definitely a unique partnership that we hold dear to our hearts. All right. Thanks again for the presentation. Uh, okay, I think we have the return of the SHAC right here, the SHAC committee. Student Health Advisory Council Committee Annual Report. Yes. Hello, floor, Dr. Crawford and President Washman. Um, I'm Rachel Barber, the Director of Health Services, presenting on the annual SHAC presentation. Um, this year, our SHAC had a reorganization amongst their board, and so they had elected a brand new president, Amber Payne. Um, she is a mother um, of a student at Hubbard this year. And she had a lot of great ideas getting started, um, just kind of had to feel it out and learn the ways of SHAC and the rules and whatnot. So she was working really hard on getting new organization, working with Danny Price, the past president and current vice president, on ways to come up with different ideas for the school. So, um, let's see if I can move this forward, maybe. There we go. Um, so, they developed a partnership with the Tyler ISD PTA Council, and they did go to that meeting so that they could hopefully get parent participation from each campus this year. That has really been a struggle in the last several years with having parents actually come to the SHAC meetings on a regular basis. We've had a lot of community support, but just the parent support hasn't been there. So they did go to that PTA Council meeting, and they had worked out with the presidents of each campus PTA to send a couple parent volunteers that had started out and started to happen and then COVID happened. So we didn't get to have our last two meetings. Um, the other issues that they were interested in dealing with this year were suicide awareness, mental health. Um, they were very on board with the anti-vaping campaign that we had in the fall and um, were really wanting to help with that. And then bullying and cyberbullying. Several of our parents that are involved in Shack actually had personal experience with their children being bullied. And so that was something that was very near and dear to their hearts and they wanted to kind of take that on. So in our February meeting, before we had left for spring break, they had actually voted to make cyberbullying and bullying their topic of interest for the year. It was a little bit late getting started on that, but they were really wanting to take that and 
come up with different projects and ideas for the campuses. And so they didn't get the opportunity to do that, so they're hoping to come back full force next fall. Um, and that's all we've got from Shaq, unfortunately, since they had a short season. <laughs> do y'all have any questions? Any questions from the board? I think you okay. clearly stated everything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, uh, moving on to our action items, A through G. Did anybody want to pull any specific one of these uh, to talk about? We've got to vote on all of them individually. Individually. Not consent. All right, good deal. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, first we have the Consider approval of the resolution and master interlocal agreement with Region 11 Education Service Center. Yeah, uh, Mr. Washman, we, we've got a, uh, an interlocal agreement with Region 11 for some professional development. Uh, Dr. Hanson, if you want to just address that from your seat, maybe. Yeah, the, 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 the technology, 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 technology integration that we're putting in place, you know, it spurred us to do it because of the break that we've been on from traditional setting. Uh, Region 11's got some opportunities. Is it Canvas? Right, they integrate with Canvas, but again, the blended learning means inside the classroom or outside. Right. right, yeah, and we do not have that in our local service center, right. uh, this PD from our local service center, so we've reached out to the Region 11, based out of Fort Worth. And we've done this before. We, we've used Region 10 before. We've used Region 4, which is Region 10 is Dallas. Region 4 is Austin. You know, all these service centers have proprietary functions. They specialize in certain things. Even Region 12 does out of Waco. So um, I don't remember which one, what they do, but that's, that's unique to their service center only. But they kind of all spread it out. And so we're asking the board to approve this professional development opportunity with uh, Region 11. Okay. Mr. Bye. President, I move that we approve this interlocal agreement as submitted by the superintendent. All right. Thank you, Reverend Haver. Do I have a second? second? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Motion carries. Moving on to item B, which is uh, approval of competitive sealed proposals for lighting at high school outdoor athletic facilities. Yeah, we're excited about this. We're going to let Mr. Loper come up to the, uh, to the podium to address this, but you know, we're getting towards the back end of, of uh, getting all of our procurement uh, done for the, uh, for the high schools as far as the, the new construction goes. Uh, this lighting package actually addresses the, the lighting uh, packages for the athletic facilities. Mr. Loper? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Crawford. Uh, as the board agenda says, when we were developing our guaranteed maximum price way back two and a half, almost three years ago, um, we actually had VE'd, value engineered the lighting out of these, both these projects. And um, we have now are available to do this. So we, we've sent out some competitive seal proposals, proposals sorry, to uh, the contractors listed and um, got some very good pricing in, uh, very good pricing as a matter of fact. So this will actually light the 100-yard soccer field, practice fields at both high schools, the baseball fields at both high schools, the softball fields at both high schools, and the tennis courts at both high schools. So we're very pleased, uh, and this will, I know this will give us a, a lot of flexibility as far as our, uh, all of our sports go. And um, so, we uh, retained, we actually put out plans and re retained uh, Thompson Architects who put this bid documents together for us. And um, as you can see, uh, they, we're gonna, we're recommending Phil Green Electrical Services who is actually the contractor that's doing our middle schools right now for, for those lighting projects. So they scored out very good and, and we're pleased to bring this to you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Loper. Does uh, anybody on the board have any questions or about this particular agenda item? I will say I'm excited to see, you know, driving down whichever the part of the loop I'm on, uh, kids playing and, 
activity going on at both of those campuses under those lights. You know, it's just uh, it's a good site. You know, and, uh, far far from uh, the site we have currently and have had for the last absolutely few decades. So, um, okay, may I entertain a motion on uh, item B? I move that we approve entering in the contact contract with Pill Green for outdoor lighting at both high schools. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it, motion carries. Okay, moving on to item C. We have uh, consider the approval of replacement synthetic playing services at Christus Trinity Francis, uh, I'm sorry, Mother Francis Rose Stadium. So uh, yeah, we were out there uh, last night and this morning and see some uh, nut grass growing up through the <laughs> through the uh, chewed up tire rubber. And uh, so it does appear that it, we do need, uh, need to address that issue. Well, we've got some, uh, it's uh, actually it's last year of warranty. Uh, that, that warranty expires here in three months, I believe. Is that correct? So the playing has uh, been through the actual lifespan of the product. The, uh, the actual fibers in the, uh, in the, the playing surface are actually failing um, to where there some, it shouldn't happen this way, but there's actually some places to where there's just rubber mm -hmm. and no fiber in there. Um, you know, not sure what the financial forecast looks like in the future, but we do have the available funds to be able to do it now. Um, and so we wanted to, wanted to bring it in front of the board to actually do that. We've actually uh, provided Hellas as the recommendation for y'all uh, to do that. Um, they've done good work here in East Texas, and they've also done pretty good work at uh, Cowboy Stadium, NRG, NRG, and Baylor as well. So they're reputable. And I'm excited about putting our kids on a new, uh, new surface if y'all approve this. Okay. Does anybody on the board have any questions or comments about this agenda item? I do have a, a question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether you can answer this, Dr. Crawford, or whether Mr. Loper is going to need to weigh in. So the way this is written, the Hellas, the total is 666,520, plus an owner's contingency of 25,000. Um, and I'm, so my first question is just Apple. I want to make sure this is apples to apples. Had we gone with Paragon, there would have been an additional 25,000 added to that bid as well. I'm just trying to figure out how far the gap is between the two. I want to make sure that it's. Yeah, the gap, the gap's 14,000. Okay. It's under your separate cover um, uh, agenda item there. Uh, Hellas is not low bid, but as far as uh, actually going and visiting the, the, the surfaces, um, actually doing some, some checking, um, with, with folks that have been using either one of them, uh, we landed on Hellas. Uh, but yes, the $25,000, we added that in there ourselves as an owner's contingency, just in case. Okay. So whenever we don't take the low bid, I'm not saying we always have to, I always like hearing mm -hmm. why we would choose somebody who is, is more expensive. So it's service and reputation were the variables in that? that that's correct. Um, we, we, Mike Carter Field does have a Hellas product on it, as do our middle schools. And we've had, you know, since those, actually we're about to be on, we completed year five or been on, we've completed five years. Uh, athletic department has been um, impressed with the responsiveness of any type of repairs or service that they needed at those facilities. Uh, we were a little concerned about uh, the field at, at, uh, at Rose Stadium, uh, the Shaw product is what they call it. Those fibers tend to have laid down on the fields that we visited, whereas the Hellas fibers continue to stand up. We felt like that the, uh, the way they've engineered their materials and their product is worth the $14,000 difference in the two projects. Okay, thank you. Along with the, the, repu the reputable stuff, the calling around talking to coaches and ADs and superintendents about why they chose that project, product as well. Okay, any other questions or comments on this particular agenda item? Okay, I'll go ahead and entertain a motion for on item C. I move we item C. Do I have a second? Okay, all in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Uh, moving on to item D, we have approval of a change order to WRL for the addition of a synthetic playing services for outdoor fields at uh, Lee and uh, additional tennis courts and outdoor fields at John Tyler. I'll, I'll introduce this, Mr. Loper, before you start talking about the uh, technical pieces of it. Um, this also was something that, that uh, we value engineered out early on in the practice. We did alternate bids uh, because we didn't know at that time if the budget was going to support it. So we did go with grass fields um, at, at our baseball and softball facilities. Um, we also pulled out the two additional tennis courts at John Tyler. Uh, to host a, a, a tournament, you need six tennis courts. Um, we haven't been living with that for years at either one of our high schools. Um, Y'all address the lighting. We haven't been living with that for years at both of our high schools. Um, and don't get me started on our softball facilities. As the daddy of a, of a girl athlete, um, I can't believe we haven't had issues with that. But this opportunity here allows us to put our student athletes in position to have uh, practice facilities and some sub varsity game facilities um, that's on the same level as their peers in 5A and 6A. Um, so I, after addressing it that way, uh, we were very excited to be able to afford this and we're doing it through a, a, a change in the guaranteed maximum price with uh, WRL. Mr. Loper, I'll let you take it away from there. Yes, thank you, Dr. Crawford, again. Um, we're very pleased to be able to do this. Um, in, in all actuality, um, we actually bid way back two and a half years ago, but today these prices even came in better than they t did two and a half years ago, which is almost to the tune of a million dollars uh, or a million plus. So um, WRL did, we, we requested them to put out a scope of work and, and to also solicit these proposals. We reviewed all the proposals with them. And um, I can tell you that um, you may ask, so what contractor or what product are they gonna use? They're gonna use Hellas. So we'll have Hellas products throughout the district, uh, almost. Um, and I might add to part of the, part of the reason um, Mr. Hager, that you that you asked uh, what the difference is. Another difference that's a little more technical in that Hellas product is their monofilament fiber that they use and the chemical that they use that also helps um, outperform beyond anybody else's as far as the UV rays go to get to the, and that's what's breaking down the, the actual field at, at uh, Rose Stadium right now. So. Yes, this will, um, this will put turf off synthetic playing surface mm -hmm. on um, uh, all the fields, uh, baseball, softball, and the practice fields at both campuses, and add their tennis courts back in. I got so a six question. tennis courts at both locations. Um, Y'all know my background. I'm an old baseball guy, and baseball guys like grass. <laughs> not a big fan of turf unless it means more to us as far as maintenance goes. It'd be, it's, it's difficult for us to, for school systems to take care of quality grass playing surfaces. And I think that we probably figured that out a long time ago. Uh, you can protect those surfaces, but with the amount of usage that our fields get, um, and we don't really have our, you know, our community can get on these fields quite a bit as well. If you had grass fields, it'd be very difficult to uh, to maintain those. So, without locking it all up, so that's why we've gone the synthetic surface route uh, the last 20 years here in Tyler ISD. I think Rose Stadium. This is on its third or fourth replacement. This will be a third. This is the third replacement. 2001, I think, was the first year, I believe. So we're about 20 years past that. So um, that's why we've gone. If you wonder why we're doing so much synthetic, that's why. It's just, we've got a lot of traffic on it, uh, not just our students. If we could just say only for games only, then I think that we could probably say we could take care of a grass field, but it's pretty difficult to do that otherwise. Okay, I think Mr. Bergfeld has a question. 
just on timing, um, Rose Stadium, what's your timing there? And are we going to run into the uh, first the game? The, the contract that's under separate cover that Mr. Watchman has to sign has a start date of Monday and done by August 1. Okay. Now, I look for them to actually beat that, that schedule since you don't have to put gravel in and drainage system and all that. So. All right. And then um, as far as the high schools go, can you remind us timeline-wise where we are? Yeah, well, we'll be next summer at John Tyler. And uh, we'll be probably starting our excavation here at Robert E. Lee in September, this September. Okay. And you need to finish all your demolition before you yes, do these projects? Yes, sir. Yeah, three years ago when we started this process, Mr. Bergfeld, this is when you were kind of looking at me going, why in the world are we, is it going to take until August of 21 to wrap all this up? This is kind of the schedule of everything that, that uh, you're starting. We finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's a very tiny light at the end of the tunnel that a year from now we should be able to effectively cut the ribbon, shoot the fireworks off and everything else with this entire project. And I might add that, uh, of course, Greg Priest and his team and all our coaches at both camps have been very helpful. I mean, they've sacrificed a lot over the last few years, uh, mm -hmm. uh, not having a baseball field or a softball field. and, and uh, Not having gyms. Yeah, and we're soon almost going to be down to one gym and no gym for a short period. So it's been uh, challenging for all. Just one point of clarification. I think I know the answer to this. The, these funds come from bond proceeds, savings in our overall project? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to approve item D. So moved. Okay, do I have a second? Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Uh, got a few left. Moving on to item E. Consider approval of teacher devices for effective delivery of instructional technology. One thing we've known but was exacerbated by the this, this uh, asynchronous delivery of instruction over the last three months is our, uh, our teacher devices throughout our um, school system, at least the portable ones, we start talking about laptops or tablets, have been fairly antiquated over time. Technology has probably hounded us for the last six years, Tasha, about replacement of that. Um, we feel that giving our teachers the right tools to provide instruction to our students is important, whether they're in person or they're doing it via distance learning. Uh, what do you have in front of you is a, is a modernization and upgrade of the actual instructional uh, technology, at least as devices go, um, that, that are portable. We do still have, through our virtual desktop, desktop, what's the I stand for that? Infrastructure, VDI. Uh, we do have desktops, but these are actually the ones that they can take home with them, um, use as far as the classrooms go as well. One exciting thing you talk about the high schools is when you start talking about some of the technology that's on here is going to be how interactive they are with the interactive televisions that we've uh, that we've purchased and placed inside of all of our high schools, where actually you're working on something and it throws it up to the to the to the uh, board automatically. So um, certainly this is something uh, that I think can help us if we have to do any type of distance learning. We're anticipating that we're going to have to do some of that in the fall. Um, Regardless of, uh, of whether or not there's still a, a, a lockdown, we think that integrating folks back into the, to the normal school setting is still going to be a little apprehensive for some, not a whole lot. We, we realize that here in Smith County. But at the same time, we want to be prepared for that. We think that this, is a, this agenda uh, uh, item addresses that by providing the right devices in teachers' hands. I'm sure you know the answer to this, or Joseph does. Um, but I, I have to ask it, you know, whenever we use Apple products and 
We are syncing them with other products uh, from time to time. I know that uh, they don't always speak the same language. I'm sure we took that into consideration. And with the other systems we're implementing so that, you know, when somebody wants to do something uh, on their iPad Air, that we don't have any uh, problems uh, with those. Our, all the systems we're kind of starting to integrate and blend and everything like that. Um, we think that that'll be a pretty seamless effort. And it should be a very seamless effort. We have a piece of software called FileWiz and we use to manage all of our iPads, so we're able to push updates and software that we want on them and also control them in a way that still allows the teachers and the staff to put other apps on there, but still if it's something that's these rules that's caused problems, we pull it back off remotely and manage all those remotely. These iPads also give our teachers the ability to connect to their virtual desktops so the same computer they have in their classroom, they can access that on their iPad or also use it as a camera for video conferencing right. and mobility in the classroom. So we chose this tool because we thought it was the best all, right. all the way around. Well, I'm sure it will be, and I uh, just had to ask because it crossed my mind. It's a good question because if you've had an Apple device trying to interact with our network, sometimes it, it hadn't been great. Now, I'll tell you where it hadn't been great has been social media, and that's not a bad problem to have when you're talking about the district's network. So if you jump on the district's network, I asked them to open up Twitter a couple of years ago and they did and we were having issues. So they've shut it down. So yeah, we can't get on to Instagram, we can't get on to Facebook, and you can't get on to Twitter. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that ain't a bad thing. <laughs> Excuse me, that ain't that's not right. Mr. <laughs> Atkins, the former English teacher over there. That isn't a bad thing. <laughs> so I know. Um so I I think that that's really where we probably struggle more than any time. Hmm. Yeah, there's some, there's always some struggles depending upon what you've got. So um, the great thing is, we're, you know, as far as the video conferencing that's been going to be able to happen, um, the recording goes up. They came, I, I turned them loose to go find the devices, and <coughs> that's what they came back with for the teacher instruction. Good deal. Does anybody else have any comments or questions on this item? Okay. I'll go ahead and entertain a motion on item E. I move that we approve item E. Do I have a second? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Uh, okay. We're moving on to item F, which is consider approval of CTE teacher devices for effective delivery of instructional technology. And this so, is the same, same thing. Um, strategy. This is just being um, procured out of the uh, CTE funding as opposed to uh, general funding. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or comments about this one? I'll go ahead and entertain a motion on item F. So moved. Second? Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Motion carries. And uh, moving on to our, our last action item here is considered approval of one-on-one -on -one student devices for effective learning technology. Same premise here, except from the student end this time. Um, one thing that we were really concerned about when we went to this um, hybrid model that we threw together was we didn't have enough technology to deploy. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I'd been oppositional to that. Um, during my career on the one-to-one, -one. but I think now this, this it probably emphasizes it more to me, and you know, we all change in how we feel, but uh, this was an opportunity for us to, to ensure some equity throughout the school system as far as technology goes. Um, every, you know, every kid having a device is not just gonna be a benefit if we go through this asynchronous and hybrid type of uh, delivery of instruction or learning for our students. We're gonna be able to use this in the classroom. We, we, we're, we're, my staff is excited. When I say my staff, I'm talking about all 2,500 folks that are, that are beneath me in the org chart are excited about this opportunity because they're gonna be able to do things inside their classroom that they haven't been able to do. Students are gonna be able to take their learning home with them better than they ever have all in one device. We've got great strategies and plans that'll be in place by the time we get back to school in regard to effective use usage of this um, but more excitingly is if you don't have internet access at home then that park and learn and i've got to come up with a better terminology than that that we're proposing 
um, will, will certainly pay dividends to us as we go forward. Mainly because we were worried about grades and feedback of learning. It was hard to do that when we were handing out packets. You know, ARP and smaller school systems were able to deliver those packets. I think they went all packets. And then they actually get those packets back and grade them. It's going to be difficult for us to do that for 18,000 students. So this is our strategy to, uh, to go forward. But again, I think once we get past this, we're going to be better than we are now because every student's going to have a device in their hand. Uh, it's exciting. Uh, to, to, to uh, bring this in front of you all today. Good deal. Anybody have any comments or questions on this particular Question item? Question regarding the, will there be an agreement between the district and the parents in regards to responsible for these? Yes, conditions? sir. Okay. Um, we, there's the great thing about this is it's already been out there for 15 years, these one-to-one -one initiatives is that there's models out there that we can actually replicate that says that there are agreements. Um, they actually have some small fee, uh, minimum fees that could be attached to that, depending upon socioeconomic status, uh, depending on what that fee could be. But yes, sir, an agreement between the, the parents and et cetera, to the point to where if you graduate from a Tyler ISD high school, and you've lost or damaged or done whatever, and you haven't been responsible for that, um, may not let you walk. So I mean, there, there's some pretty draconian things that could could be develop through that agreement. But yes, sir, we're not just going to pass these out and, and say that. Hope hope you see them next year. And the parents have to agree to this, or because I can see some parents not agreeing to it. Um, so what happens to the student and the availability of the unit for the student? Well, that's the that's the thing that we need to do a good job of explaining to the parents that this is a, this is part of their um, instructional arsenal, uh, the toolbox, the uh, you know textbooks. Um, you know, everybody was in the old in the old days, or even when I was still in high school, or even when I was still a principal. You know, we were handing out textbooks that were that thick, and they were putting them in their backpacks, and you were having to lug them around everywhere. Um, this that's kind of going to replace that so I think that as you, as you move into modernization of your school system and your instructional delivery uh, we'll communicate that out to parents to say that that's something that we need to go ahead and do and again there's always going to be this opportunity to work with parents on the fee associated with it if we get to that point are these checked out by year are they checked out I think you mentioned last meeting or whenever that it was based on, um, like, if a family had one or two devices at home, their kid didn't get one. That's what we did. That's what we did whenever we had this issue. Um, we're going to have some opportunities to flesh some of that out as far as opting out if you want one or not. If you have something at home, it'll take care of it. Because ultimately, the student is going to be responsible for the learning that's going on. So. AJ Crawford has a Chromebook at home. Um, as long as it's compatible with what we're doing, I may not take one of those. But we did run into these situations to where families that had means were saying, that we've only got two computers in our entire home, we've got four kids. So this is going to be something that we'll have here. So yes, sir, you're not going to be required to get it, our stuff as long as you have the capability to get on and access our technology on the LMS. And our LMS, Canvas, is accessible from any device, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, so yes, sir, we will. We will so we've got 9,000 units for our 18,000 kids. And y'all will figure out how that's. OK. Yeah, we realize that we may not give out 18,000 uh, Chromebooks, but you do have to have some in inventory in case they don't work, and in case they get damaged, in case they're lost. We do have, as part of our agreement with the company that we're using, there are things built in there for that. Um, when we check them out, we check them back in. It's much like reconditioning football helmets and shoulder pads. When we get those back in, they actually take them back to the, to the company, correct, Joseph? wipe them down, clean them, do all the repairs and work that needs to happen. So it's a pretty good 
concept. And that's, that's at the end of the school year. year. Yes, sir. Okay. But during the year, if there's something going on with the device, we all have technology that sometimes yeah. fouls up. Right. Um, we're able to check that in with one of the, the librarians at the school. MTS is what we call them, media technology specialist. Um, and then they'll be able to check barcode that back in and then hand you a new one and then we'll ship that one off to get repaired or, or, uh, or clean or whatever we need to have happen. Thank you. So each campus will manage the issuing of the computers? Sure. The, the district's technology department, obviously, when we receive those, we'll, we'll barcode everything as far as that goes. Well, I'm sorry, Tasha, you're telling me I'm wrong. Okay, taking us out of the mix. Okay. okay. But the barcodes are what? That's what the MTA, the right. assistant, or the specialist. Okay. Okay. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Uh, if not, I'll go ahead and entertain a motion on item G. I move that item G be approved. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. The motion carries. Um, I will say this. This particular workshop, we've had items A through G, and I love looking back there and seeing successful student outcomes on the back of the wall and being able to look at our agenda item and see items that clearly improve and impact successful student outcomes. And um, these are all exciting agenda items, and I'm I'm proud to see us doing it. So um, we'll move along to the 2021 budget update. So Tasha's going to come up. Do you want this microphone to sit your seat, or you want to come up here? I think we can usually make you come up to the podium. So y'all know Ms. Bjork, our CFO. She's going to uh, provide the first look at next year's budget. Before we get into next year's budget, I wanted to discuss 1920. Y'all have heard about the stimulus money, the ESSER, E-S-S-E-R, it's Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. We are gonna receive 4.3 million, and private schools get about 5%, so we will see, we'll actually have 4 million. It's not extra money, though. Our 1920 money from the state will be reduced by that amount to help with all the things that have been going on. So if you've heard about this money, it's not extra. So we, there, the things that you can put in it are like these devices so we will probably code these devices into that money the teacher and student and then also any summer learning projects that we have or after school learning we can code to this we can go back to March 13th and pick up anything that relates to COVID like masks anything that FEMA won't reimburse us, premium pay, that type of thing, delivering packets, transportation costs. Um, so we'll be doing that. Um, we have until June 30, 21 to spend it, but we'll spend it before then because we're gonna try to put as much in there from this year as we can because we're looking forward to next year's budget. So we'll probably get it all spent with things we've already spent done this year. And Tasha, one question there. It's a dollar for dollar reduction in state funding for federal or is it just a I'm not sure how that's gonna work. They're gonna reduce our ADA. So they're gonna apply a formula. I'm sure it's pro rata. That the the plug, I mean, that, that's what we're calling it. Right. That's the Edom way of saying it. Yeah. It's plug. <laughs> The plug, we, we didn't find out about the plug till three weeks ago. Right, two but weeks ago. really I think 
people thought this was going to be yeah. 2021. I just found out on May 28th that it's 1920. So that's why this. It, it's interesting because y'all remember when, when this first started, uh, TEA came out and said, oh, y'all don't worry about funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're good. Just let's just get through these three months. They didn't know about this coming. They didn't know that this was going to happen. Um, but I think they've been comptroller's office has been very opportunistic with this um, I think they've seen this as a kind of a, a, a lifesaver life buoy that to, that they've thrown out there that they can go ahead and plug this year's um, budget which surprises me because I really thought that next year was where they would use it because now that probably puts a little bit of a flag up that they may we may get um, how what do they call it Pro, pro, rate. pro rate. yeah. So the proration make up. Well, we may see a reduction this coming year, but I think we've prepared for that. Y'all, y'all are pretty aware of what we've been doing. Hope so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hope's not a good strategy. Right. But we've done. We have had a strategy on this, and we're going to turn it over to Tasha. Let's talk about 2021. Right. And I think it just dawned on me. Y'all have these, right? Uh -huh. Did I give you these? I yeah. think I gave. Right. Yeah. We have. Them. Yeah. Okay, I don't think I have it for the screen. But if you'll go to revenue sources, the second page, and then in your agenda item, let me get there. Page 26, right there. The revenue. Can you put it on the Okay. <laughs> so if you'll keep a finger on, this is our actual revenue page that's in detail, and this is just a summary page. Now what, I did this about two weeks ago, or three actually, and some things have changed since then. We've been given some advice on how to handle some different things in the revenue estimate, and so this is, very preliminary. Um, for state funding, they suggested that we reduce our ADA a little bit, and I kept it flat when I did the estimate because I'm used to doing that, but in case of sickness and that type of thing, reduce our ADA just slightly, not a lot, so I'm gonna need to do that. Increase sub expense. I did increase it some, but maybe not enough, so I'll be looking at that. And then also, in case we have an overabundance of property tax appeals, we may need to, we won't get our values till July 25th. I used what they'd given us at that point in time. So we'll, I'll probably adjust it down. But we're still in pretty good shape as far as that goes. So our state funded revenue is around 40%. Last year it was 39 local property tax revenues 58 about the same as last year and so on now if you'll turn the page um, let's see. and look at page 28 in the agenda while we're going over this the state revenue increased slightly in order to take care of our property tax rate going down again. So I've got a slide on that next, but the local share is now current year. So when, we, when our property values come out in July, that automatically determines the amount of money that they're gonna reduce our state funding by whereas before it was a year lag. So now it's immediate, but we don't really know till, I won't know till February 2021 what my true reduction will be because it's hard to figure that out. It's almost impossible. And so it's always, you know, I try to use the same amount it increased last year, I have to do a proration, so hopefully we'll be pretty close on that. But with um, 
The state funding, it's an increase of around 3.9 million. I will make some adjustments, it's gonna go down, but so far that's what I had. If you'll turn the page and look at your next page in the packet, um, page 27, these are our property taxes. And our values went up about six and a half percent. And I use a collection rate of 99 and a half cents. And our current tax rate is a dollar 33 and a half. And I'm projecting it to be around a dollar 2958 although that could change too, because they have made some new rules on that, and I'll try to explain it. So our um, 18, like the 1920 tax rate, the compressed rate, the year we're in right now was 93 cents, and we added four cents to it. So our m and tax rate was 97 cents on the year that we're in right now. They are compressing it down again to 91.64 cents. But that can change based on your values. TEA is going to calculate our compressed rate on August. They will give it to us on August 5th. We have to publish on August 7th, so we're having a board workshop on August 6th, <laughs> where you'll see the new tax rate. But the maximum it can be is the 91.64 cents plus our four pennies that we add on, our golden pennies. And the legislature's given us a chance this year to add an extra penny with no tax rate election. The vote has to be unanimous by the board. Everyone in attendance has to unanimously vote the penny. And then, so what I'm proposing is an increase. Go ahead and add that penny, and we're going to reduce a penny on the debt service tax rate. You can tell it's 36 and a half down to 35 and a half. So we'll still lower the rate. Right now, almost four cents. It could be more, could be less, depending on our, how our values come out. And then. Um, Right now, our compressed rate, what I've calculated, is 89 cents. And then the five pennies is where the 94 cents comes from for next year's tax rate. And I know that's all confusing. It's confusing to me, too. <laughs> you know, they, they rewrote the whole formula right. last year in the 86th. So I think they're still struggling with trying to get us interpretations of what to do. So. Right, I watched a webinar yesterday on it. So, <laughs> anyway, so that's what's gonna happen with that. So that's our local tax revenue. So maybe three million, not sure yet, increase there. And then we have some other increases and decreases in revenue. And those are summarized on page 28 in the agenda up at the top, but I also have them on your PowerPoint. We have obviously the interest income is going to decrease a little bit, or quite a bit, probably in half from what we've been used to because of the economy. Our rental income has been decreasing over the years. TRS on behalf is gonna decrease because we cut 68 positions out of general fund. And then just little miscellaneous income decrease. So that was a net decrease of around almost a million dollars. So our proposed revenue increase is around six million dollars. Now, when we get to expenses, because we're uncertain about what will happen in 21-22 with the new legislative session, I 
and proposing the use of the, of the funds we have in mostly one-time type expenditures. And the biggest one is a retention stipend for employees versus a raise. Because if we are cut back in the next year and we still have to give those raises, or we have to keep them in salary, then we could have to find other things to cut. And I don't know how much that'll be yet. It'll be how much is left when we get more solid numbers. Yeah, you know, when we talked about this after the session, about what we were gonna do as far as raising it, we, we discussed a stipend. Um, but, you know, statewide, even us, we were all fat on the hog and went ahead and married ourselves to those increases. So I think this is a more conservative strategy to, uh, to do that. You know, there's been a lot of school systems that have jumped out there already and adopted 4% raises. I just, with all the uncertainty that's going on, even though we don't even know if we're gonna be prorated or not next year, um, I think marrying to that and having the board adopt that and then going back and having to either do that or some type of riff, I just don't think that's a very methodical way of going about this. So that's why we've said that if we do anything, then it could be done in the form of a stipend. And again, that would be something that we make the decision a little bit closer to when we actually do it, as opposed to announcing that we're gonna do a 4% raise. Because we don't know, the, 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 the fact is we don't know. Um, and what she's alluding to is exactly what we did last year um, when we actually went ahead and put it into the salary schedule. If you, if you go ahead and do that now, then you're gonna marry yourself to that salary schedule, that pay scale after the 87th legislature. And, and there's, we don't know. I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty scary thing. We know how they've reacted in the past. You look at whenever they reacted in 2011 after the recession was finally over with, um, we wound up getting our $5 billion cut out of public ed, and that's when we had to do a lot of the things that we did. How much did we reduce back then? I think it was around nine to 10 million. Nine to 10 million. So we're just trying to make sure we're doing things a little bit more methodical for y'all to consider, um, as opposed to just saying that we're just gonna get married to, to a, a salary increase because we don't know if that money's gonna be there from the state. So if you look at um, page 28 in the agenda to the, we reduced 68 positions out of general fund and that was around $4.1 million. And just so you know, we reduced about 18 positions out of grant funding, different grants, four or five different grants. So we'll be able to utilize those dollars for some of the things like in Title I, some school-wide type things. So that was the biggest reduction, but then there were things that we had to add. We had to um, change our funding source for around 12 of our pre-K classrooms. So we're funding 12 extra, so that means a teacher and an aide for 12 classrooms. We had Special ed just continues to, our student growth in that is, just continues to rise. And we've had to add many positions this year and the grant, we've had to shift some money from there back into the general fund and that was around half a million. So altogether that was half a million. Let me stop on that, Tasha. Okay. Um, just to kind of refresh everybody's memory about special education. Remember there was a federal lawsuit about how Texas had, Texas had capped the amount of special education students that there were. Of course, TEA fought it. You fight the feds whenever they sue you, but, but the feds won. And so um, you wind up uh, saying, okay, no more cap. But then the state turns around and doesn't fund you for that increase. So it truly was probably a, a, a funding governor that cap was. Um, but now you've seen this explosion in special education enrollment. Where were we at before that all happened, Dr. Hansen? Were we at 6% and we're now at 10 or 11? We're at 10, 5, about to be 11. So we're about to double the amount of special ed students that we have with the same amount of funding. 
So that's why you're having to dedicate some of the operating dollars in there because there's not special education dollars coming from the feds or from the state in regard to that. It's, and so we've it's, had it's a, tough. Yeah, we've had an explosion of one-on-one -on -one aids and yeah. That's true. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, and in our strategies, we, we're taking a look at how what our strategies are. You can't just throw thirty thousand dollars at a, at one single issue every time it happens, which is the, about the cost of an aid. And so that's something we've got to do a better job at. And I think we, we have put the brakes on that a little bit, but our numbers do keep going up because there is no, it's not as strenuous to, to become special education as it used to be. A lot of them transfer into those one-on-one aids and then you have to watch. Yeah, if they've already arted in, say they got arted in for that at Carthage. When they move here, we are, we have to have fidelity to that ARD, to that ARD document. That's federal law. Mm -hmm. And so when we did the budget last year, we didn't, this has just been things we've added this year that I've kind of had to absorb, but I went ahead and added it for next year. I increased sub expense 100,000. That's probably not enough, I'm not sure. Um, we'll probably increase it a little more. And the transportation over time, I need to increase because that just seems to be going up every year and then the one of the larger items is new cust or the new high schools we need 13 new custodians that's around three hundred thousand dollars for 13 and that is based on square footage and those are not full-time positions when I mean, they are full-time positions excuse me but they're usually split in two is that correct what do you mean doesn't she hire they, no, they hire, they hire people like to work part time in those custodial well, positions. Well, these are full. These are other full timers. Uh -huh. Okay. At the high schools, we yeah. okay up the level on them. Okay, there you go. So there were thirteen that we had to add. Well, I think it ended up being twelve after we all said and done six and six. I've changed it since then, but she okay. told me she needed one less. And then. I think our unemployment benefits will rise a little bit for next year based on what's happened. Um, let's see what else. Our health insurance fund maximum, you know, we're self-funded. And our contract with Christos, it's going up. Let me see here. $457,000, which is, I think it's a 10% increase. So that's what that is. So on payroll, we're reducing it around 2.1 net, 2.1 million net. And then if you'll turn the page for instruction and instructional support, I have the funds in here for the one-to-one -one devices. Um, these are all one-time use things or one-time things the inst band instruments kilns purchases and then special projects and curriculum needs those are things that we have in there that we can remove the next year if we need to or we can build it into the budget that's kind of like school buses I have 750,000 built into the budget for replacement every year and we've done that for like five years. But it's always there that if we can't do it one year, that's funding. So now the one-to-one -one devices, we're going to buy the ones y'all approved today this summer. So it's coming out of this year's budget, the new CARES Act funding. But this $1.5 million is... I think next year we have to replace 3,000, 3,500 student devices because in every year we'll need to replace some more because they're good for about four years. And then they'll roll off. And so I'm trying to build that into the budget. Hopefully it can stay. But what we tried to do were just the one-time items.
because we don't know what's going to happen the next year. Now there are, like there are, the athletic official fees went up, fine art entry fees have increased. In addition, we're doing more fine arts events. Um, let's see, I have a reduction on Camp Tyler, moving it from an overnight to a day camp. And that saves around 212000 And let's see. So altogether, the instruction and instructional support went up about $1.7 million. And then the other departmental budgets were just minor audit contract. Well, we had an increase in maintenance and custodial supplies for the new high schools. That's around 245000 The tax assessment and collection fee goes up every year. We pay whatever their increase is. And then preventive maintenance fund, our three pennies, is going up 167000 it's based on whatever the values are, three pennies of the tax rate. That'll change once we get our final values. So basically we'll have a balanced budget. The, as he says, plug will be whatever we decide to do for retention stopping. That's the one thing that we haven't ironed out yet. Now there are some expenses that I've not been able to put in here yet because we're still waiting to get numbers and that's the maintenance contracts on um, adding the extra devices, the 9,000 student devices and the teacher devices. We have to buy licenses mm -hmm. and there's a lot of stuff but it takes a while to get those quotes in so there will be another increase in technology budget for that. And I'm just unsure yet what that is. But I think that's kind of the basics of it. Do y'all have any questions? I'll try to answer them. Tasha, I have just one question just to check my understanding and make sure I kind of mm -hmm. got all this. So tax rate currently going down uh, through cost savings and eliminating personnel positions if I'm looking at this right, we have right now a budget that's flat, essentially, within $54,000 with a future recommendation about uh, retention pay mm -hmm. uh, possibly coming in. And then the other items that you just disclosed that are kind of a work in progress as we go mm -hmm. through this. So do I have that? Did I... Kind of yes, get the big picture. because our revenue is going up around six million dollars. It'll probably be five by the time I get done. Just guessing. Um, so there'll probably be, if you look on page one of this, I don't know what, page 19 of the agenda, at the bottom, you know, usually I have this zeroed out. That's what I had left before, after I'd done everything. But that will probably go down to five million, I would say. I'm not sure. Until I get better values and refigure the tax rate and all that type of thing and get the new technology items in here. So that would be either available for stopping or to do anything else we might need to do that might be one time, because there could be some other things that come up. You just never know. But at least we're positioned, I feel like, for 21-22. But that cushion That's, also is there if there's a proration that occurs. Right. The unknown. Because so it, it's possible we'll have a proration. The project that we embarked upon and on the reorg, that's yes, that's it. But we knew that, that that we needed some flexibility to to expect the unexpected, and so if they wind up cutting us, we'll be. In that's probably what they'll cut us into one. Then you guys start talking about this whole project over again okay. after the eighty seventh legislature. Hope not. But I do too, but 
I've been through it once. And we, we've got good. other ideas. Um, we right. could go get close to that other half if it was a nine or $10 million dollar cut. Um, but y'all know where all of our money is. And so it would be another reorg type of deal. Well, I just want to applaud the uh, fiscal conservatism of reducing expenses and, um, and being cautious about what you commit um, for the future. Just on the corporate side, I know dialing back compensation is super painful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to be conservative and cautious here, uh, while also recognizing we're in a competitive labor market, we want great teachers to get those successful student outcomes. Um, but I just applaud the direction that you've pursued the last several months of making some painful expense reductions to prepare us for these tough times. Now we just need to get the outcomes to match. Right. <laughs> Painful reduction we just did. That'd be fun. Squeezing that juice out of the lemon. So <clears throat> Okay, any, anybody have any other questions? I'm sure we'll have questions down the road. We'll have some more meetings. Especially on the <laughs> shell game of a you yeah. know, financing uh, setup that the state has. I have questions about that extra penny and, and all that. Anyway. Um, but okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you. And um, we're going to jump into executive session now. Uh, do we have any action to follow? No, sir. Doesn't look like we have any action to follow, so. Okay, we'll go into executive session.